Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. It's your girl, Jacqueline, alongside Mr. Mark Ellis, who is happy, well refreshed. I, I think all you've been doing is watching Sports Center. That's pretty much all I've yeah. been doing for the past life. So, yeah, I'm pretty happy, you could say. <laughs> you look like you're in your comfort zone. Yeah. You, you have a hot beverage. And a cold on, beverage. On your right. Then you have a cold beverage to your left. You got some cheese hits. And I mean, this is this I'm, is your station. I am literally trying to chill. Also, I need to like. I feel like I'm on her NPR show right now. No, <laughs> I need to ease into being in the office because we haven't discussed this, but I was very much like Nat Turner when it came to like reporting back to the <laughs> office. Like I was trying to lead a revolution. And so giving me beverages and snacks is kind of the only thing that Do keeps me Do you have a saying, workspace here in no, the office? No, I don't. Okay. I mean, it's okay, though. They know I don't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> the key... To great productivity is understanding your employees' needs. I mean, look, they know that I, look, a lot of my work is done outside of the building. I'm not even, like, coming against that. Like, at first I was kind of like, well, I need a place. But then in the back of my mind, I was like, you don't want to be here anyway. You come in here to take a break from work. I mean, I You come into the office to relax. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I coffee badge it up. Also, I have a great home office. Like, if I had a crappy home Mm. office, I would be like, oh, I don't want to be. It's a great setup. Yeah. I've I've experienced it. I've actually seen you working because I've come over to your place (laughs) And I'll just hang out with the dog because you're still, like, cranking away on an article for yeah, the last 10 minutes. And yeah. I'm like, I'll just uh, make myself a drink. And it's never 10 <laughs> minutes. But the bar is stocked, which, uh, Grace, you are more than welcome to join me there. Um, I'm glad you're joining us here, of course. Uh, Heather Grace Hancock, actress, uh NCIS Los Angeles, SWAT, Criminal Minds. I'm glad you're taking a break from your very busy schedule as a working <laughs> actor to come talk about a movie that's near and dear to my heart and oh. apparently near and dear to yours, too. So much so. So happy to be here. So good to see <laughs> you both. Um, and this film is just, it's just a delight. So I'm so happy to talk about it. Oh, I'm I'm very excited. We're getting spooky, ladies and gentlemen. It is the 1989 classic. If I told you how many times I watched the bootleg version that I copied <laughs> off of Disney Channel of this movie... It would be embarrassing. It if you know how many times uh, kids that don't know VHS tapes, if you watch them too long, they will warp. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did that to mm-hmm. this movie? That's right, Teen Witch. It is forty three percent rotten on the tomato meter, but it has a seventy four percent audience score because there is a god out there. There is a thirty fifth god thirty fifth anniversary <laughs> for this movie coming up <laughs> in April. This is one of those movies that, again, I I have been like, we've got to cover it. We've got to cover it because I've I've had thoughts for so, so very long. Grace, I'm so glad you're here to join me because apparently you too have had thoughts for so very long. I Well, firstly, I was thrilled when you texted me about this. I had no idea anybody but myself and my sister knew this film even existed. I had no idea it had a theatrical release. <laughs> I had no idea it was iconic outside of my household. So what a delight and what a treat. And rewatching it as an adult is, uh, tr- it was something that special. It was very sure. strange when I, I hit up Grace because I'm like, okay, who do I know that might have seen this movie Teen Witch, which I'm looking at and I'm like, I've never heard of this movie or seen this movie. Maybe there was like, I heard Jacqueline talking about it in one of our meetings from years <laughs> oh, yeah. back where it's like, well, we got it. I mean, Teen Witch has got to be on the docket. Yeah. And I think the team was like, okay, yeah, we'll put it on there. We'll put it right after <laughs> Encino like, Man Just give her her cheese yeah. She'll forget. <laughs> just give her cheese sits and her beverages. You know me so well. Thank <laughs> you. But then, you know, but then Grace immediately writes back. She's like, oh my God, my sister and I grew up. We, we quote this to each other yeah. in our secret language. And I'm like, I guess this is a thing. <laughs> yeah. And again, 35th anniversary in April. You know who saw this movie a couple months ago on the big screen at a real movie theater? Producer Brian. Yeah. Just, I don't even know if he knew we were doing it on the show. He just you wanted did? to see a flick. Uh, did your the wife make just you? just a line? Yeah, the wife. Oh. He's nodding. The wife made him. Because oh, this, is, this was like, coming together. This was of a certain millennial girl's age movie. Like, it, it's sort of like our Hocus Pocus. Like, it was, totally. it was that movie. So, Grace, if you will... Can you tell the incredibly rewatchable, very beloved story of Teen Witch? Oh, like the synopsis. Give me a quick synopsis. Give me okay. just high bar beats. Oh, man. It's so good. <laughs> well, it starts when a man... No. So it's about this, this young girl who is about to turn 16. Her name is Louise Miller. And, uh, or wait, no, is that her name? Or yes, no, you had that perfectly yeah. right. Perfect. Like, not a lot of See, it's, like, it's in my body and anymore. I didn't even know. You I know, know your I mean? question. It's like deeply in my <laughs> DNA as a child. <laughs> yes. Um, and she is in love with Brad, the quarterback, as we all were a little Stud. bit. Mm-hmm. And he, of course, hits her with his car, as one does. 
And <laughs> by doing so, she pops a tire on her bike. So she has to go into this very spooky household and finds this psychic there who's just like one of my favorite parts of the whole film. Yes. And she's like, well, no, I just need to use your phone. And she's like, let me read your palm. And then she's like, oh, you're going to be a witch in like a week. And she's like, super cool. Gotta go. <laughs> so she goes back to school and then she starts to notice the things that she's wishing are coming true. She's like, I just wish that Brad would look at me. And then he turns and he goes, yeah, he does. <laughs> and she's like, well, this is spooky. So it builds and builds and builds. And then, of course, we learn the beautiful lesson that, you know, you have to be careful what you wish for. Sometimes the things that we think we want aren't what we really want. And so she throws her necklace away. Yeah, she gets these and, powers and does exactly yeah. what a teenage girl would do is say, I want to be the most popular girl in school. Yeah. And then she is. Fair. And then by Which the means end, she just does her hair differently. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very, she's all that before she's all that. <laughs> totally. Hey, it's a big jump when you get to ride in the convertible with the cool kids to school yeah. every day and you get to ditch your nerdy friend who, yeah. you know, we feel bad Polly, for. the real hero of this story. <laughs> We're going to get I there. Uh, but anyway, by the, end, by the end, she realizes she doesn't need her powers. She's powerful and she's enough without them. Um, one of the best soundtracks to ever grace the 80s. Let me let me just tell you. Thank you, Grace, for that incredible synopsis. Thank that was beautiful. Oh, thank you. Witch. Yeah. Oh, I love this movie. Um, it's it's interesting to see, too, because it was a sort of like secret movie. It came out, totally. out for like two weeks, made like no money. But then it became this replayable movie that came on Disney Channel, TNT. It was just always kind of on back when they would do that with movies like Hocus Pocus, like mm -hmm. Return to Oz, like The Worst Witch. Oh, Return and they, to those, Oz. All those movies sort of permeated our teendom. And I think Tim Ryan is going to sort of recap. <laughs> that is the reason why this movie has become one of these like cult classic, beloved, but not crazy critically well-received film. So let's hear it for Two Minutes with Tim. Two Minutes with Tim. Teen Witch had what could politely be called a troubled production history. It was also released on the same day as Pet Cemetery and Field of Dreams. And with the likes of Major League, Say Anything, Rain Man, Twins, and Heathers still in theaters, it was a serious box office dud. Critics were largely unimpressed as well, calling Teen Witch an uneven mix of fantasy, musical, and after-school special. So why does Teen Witch have such an enthusiastic cult following? Because it was on cable all the time in the early 1990s, where its strangeness and campiness felt more at home than on the big screen. Teen Witch is rotten at 43% on the tomato meter with 21 reviews, and it has a 75% audience score. So what did the critics have to say? In a rotten review, Chris Hicks of Salt Lake City's Deseret News wrote, it's surprisingly shoddy, with a very bland script and indifferent direction, only adequate performances from most of the cast, and very choppy editing that cuts either too quickly or too slowly from scene to scene. However, in a fresh review, Barbara Van Cherry of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette wrote, the movie is aimed at preteens and teens who long for popularity and dates with the school quarterback. This, in fact, would be the perfect movie for a slumber party of 11-year-olds. The Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus reads, while drenched in upbeat messages and heart, the wonders of high school, love, and magic often don't meld well enough for this inoffensive teen witch. So that's teen witch. Let's get you back to Jacqueline and Mark, two people who have the power to make anything you want happen. Back to you, folks. The magic was in us the whole time. It really was. Okay, so Mark, you watched this last night? I did. Enjoyed it for the first time in my life. And I'm glad you enjoyed it, too, because this is like, this is hitting right up in the teen girl's wheelhouse, and I love that you felt at home with it. It's wild to think about the history of it, too, because it started out as like they wanted to make a spinoff to Teen Wolf, mm -hmm. and then you had, Teen Wolf is 42% on the tomato meter. Teen Wolf 2 with Jason Bateman's like 8%. Yeah. And then this one rebounded. This is actually higher than Teen Wolf. Yeah. So, and I'm, I don't consider the, the MTV ones because I didn't, I mean, again, I know that they're around. I know they're hugely yeah. popular for a different generation. It ain't going to get me. Teen Witch, though, like you're watching it, and it was almost like they made an after school special, but they're like, you know what? Let's let the kids direct and edit. And <laughs> let, let, let's just let them do everything. Here's the equipment, kids. Good luck with what you come up with. And they yeah. came up with a great metaphor as to why you shouldn't do drugs. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know? So, so you think Rotten Tomatoes is right? I think, I, from a movie perspective, yeah, I think Rotten Tomatoes is right. Like, I, I, I do see a lot of redeeming value to it. And there is, there is a real heart to it, but. 
I, I don't know that it's a fresh movie. <laughs> <laughs> Philistine. <laughs> Grace, where are you at? Is Rotten Tomatoes right or wrong? <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say, even though, because I was a 90s kid, so that's how we found it. I always thought it was a Disney Channel original movie because it was on all the time. We were like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this, I mean, this movie is unhinged. Yeah. This movie is out of control. It is chaos. It makes no sense. It's so cringe. And it is, I can't think of anything because I feel like we say this a lot, but I don't know that I've ever meant this. It's so bad that it's good. Yes. So it's like <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes is absolutely right. But it is like a very sort of like time capsule-esque thing. Like when certain lines, I was like, oh my God, yeah. It's like me and my sister have all these inside jokes. We don't even know what the hell they're from at this point. And I was like, it's from Teen Witch. <laughs> so it's so near and dear to my heart, but it is, it's real bad. I think <sighs> Unhinged is a great way to describe this movie because I'll, I'll give this a movie like this fresh if I feel like I could trust it to go with me to Las Vegas, you know? Mm. But you can't trust Teen Witch in Las Vegas with its own devices because it's just going to go nuts in all these different ways. So I, I really do appreciate a lot of it, but I can't I can't trust you. <laughs> I, I need you to be supervised at all times, Teen Witch. No, listen, I can admit that, especially <laughs> when it comes to some of the acting in this, Oh. We're, we're, Wolf. we're, we're going like there were, there were some things about this production that did not necessarily gel. And I will be the firm one to say that it's not going to be like what I was talking about with like Jupiter Descending a few weeks ago, where I'm like, in my heart, this is certified fresh. No, it's not that because <laughs> there's not that level of filmmaking behind it. But what I will say is the movie is so watchable. It's so iconic. There's so mm. many iconic moments for it that I would be willing easily to put this in the like high 60s range. And this has the exact same score as that film that I often cite, which is Constantine. But this mm. one is actually, in my opinion, I'm like, no, if you put this higher than Constantine, I would actually kind of agree. <laughs> I would agree for this one reason, for how iconic it is. There's great moments of Constantine and I love and live for that movie. The filmmaking, I think, is much more at a higher level. But there are like, People have made entire personalities around that scene, top that. Like, oh, uh -huh. people, like, recreate the um, iconic, you know, <sighs> never yeah. going to be the same again, like, most popular girl sequence. I like boys, girl. <laughs> Bars. Dude, I like boys <laughs> is the most insane five minutes that I've ever seen in any film. Absolutely. Ever. But the choreography by a West Side Story <laughs> choreographer, I might add, amazing. Yeah. Like, there's like a mini musical in this is one of the best musicals you've ever seen. There's a mini sex comedy in this. It's just one of the greatest sex comedies that we didn't get to witness because they toned it down a bit. Right. And there's also this great coming of age story. And it's unfortunately the schizophrenic aspect of the production is the only reason why <laughs> it is the way that it is. But this all could have been stitched so much better. And I say this as a heavy romance reader if they would have just let the sex that was clearly in the undertones I of this know. movie have its breathing room. But we'll get there um, when we dive deeper into movie talk. So, Brian, cue the music. So this was, a, like I said, a Disney Channel movie. It was also like a Showtime Encore. Remember Encore, which is now just stars? But, like, remember the Encore oh, channel? Oh, right, right. Yeah. This was all over Encore, and I lived for it. The outfit that Louise wears when she's trying to be cute before she becomes the most popular girl in school, I tried to recreate that. Because, like, I didn't understand that the that was her a mom bad— picks out for No, no, the other one. Like, the one that she, like, when she goes on the date with the goofy cousin. Oh, right, right. Uh -huh. The nerd? The, yes. Yep. And she's the like— The very handsy nerd? Is the very handsy nerd, <laughs> I might add. Who's which still God. in some alternate dimension, for all we know. <laughs> Lock that guy up. My God. I mean— He had the classic <laughs> 80s nerd laugh, though. He really <laughs> did, dude. <laughs> also, if they did his hair differently and, like, styled him better, that dude is actually hot. Like, no, that dude is not oh, unattractive. Totally. And also, like, all these looks are totally doable today. Yes. I was like, we can make it <laughs> yeah. work. But that— I mean, he's a sexual predator. But <laughs> other than that— Yeah, and he is a 35-year-old man also. <laughs> yes, so that was absolutely. problematic. No, he um he would have been He's like he, forty. He is. Oh my god. Now he just he looked. They all. I mean, I feel like yeah. even like Brad, Brad especially. This is the time when actors were like, "I'm thirty five. I'm sixteen. And it no, was like we were all just okay Dan with Gautier it. plays Brad, uh, who yeah. I, I immediately recognized as like the bad boyfriend in Son in Law. Yes. This yeah. Is years right. later. Yeah. He. I think he was twenty five during the yeah <laughs> made yeah. this movie. And then Robin Lively was closer. She was like eighteen or nineteen, so she was actually yeah. closer to her age. Obviously, the young actor that played her brother was was actually her. Age, so that young actor is, oh, is, I didn't know is that. That's playing funny. younger than what he actually is. He was, he was a, great, he was a good snot nosed was kid brother. Such a good snot nosed <laughs> little brother. Um, I will say Dan, very similarly to the guy from Pretty in Pink, was kind of just plucked out of obscurity for being like a very oh. jock type character. He's hunky. And, He's and a he, hunk. oh man, that scene of them. <laughs> 
Listen, I, before we get into this, I just want to do a recreation of some of the greatest scenes. There is a <laughs> soft jazz saxophone sex scene in this movie. Mm-hmm. That is... I'm so glad they didn't cut that out because he just he looks at her. And like at, when I first watched it, I didn't realize that this was a sex scene. But like now no, I'm like, I'm, that was a sex scene. <laughs> it's, it's like the weird extreme close up on like her shoes I know. where she like takes off her shoes and put them on a windowsill. And we're like, why? What's happening? And he's doing this like coquettish thing up the stairs. Like and then he like runs and poses and you're just like, what is happening? And it, then they make out. It feels like so a Celine Dion video. Like it feels yeah. like old 80s, like music video movie. Like, did you feel, did you feel the sexiness of that I, moment? I, this movie telegraphed exactly the <laughs> year that it came out. And really right from, uh, you get to the sex scene and that's wonderful. But even the opening credits of this movie have yeah. like that rockin' saxophone that's like post St. Elmo's Fire, pre-Nirvana. <laughs> and so you know right like what the shoebox to put this movie in. And mm-hmm. I was disappointed like y'all that we didn't just get like, because originally this movie was going to be raunchy. It was going to be like yeah. rated R, like a Porky's kind of thing. And yeah. if you go back and watch the first Teen Wolf, there's a lot more raunch than yeah. I remember because yeah. we had taped the edited for TV version. Yeah. When you watch the actual one, and you get to see Styles' shirt, like what he's actually wearing uh, to school, which is the shirt that says, what are you looking at, d- nose? Yeah. And then you have, like, it, it, there's there's a full-on sex scene where yeah. the wolf howls in Teen Wolf. Yeah. And I just feel like, you know, equality being what it is in this day and age, maybe not 1989. Give her her full-on sex. Give her her yeah. howl moment. There was, a, there was a, something about Teen Wolf that wasn't talked about, which was that he was a horny teenager, wolfy t- sort of dude that got to, like, basically— when boys will be boys, that idea, like, because when he turned into the wolf, he also became a bit of a jerk. There's something to be said for in Teen Witch, they were trying to say when she became the witch, she became a vamp. She became this, like, alluring sex symbol. And all of that was in that hair because they made that hair. Absolutely. So, so big. Um, Also, the teacher. Oh, oh. Mr. Weaver? Mr. Weaver. Oh, and I hate comedy him. Comedy legend, he's Shelley Berman. Shelley, I was just saying, he's he is true like, villain of this. He, true villain also giving, like, Alan Rickman level performance. Like, he was not <laughs> uncommitted. Like, he knew what he was in that in this movie, but he committed to every yeah. second. Like, that's a great physical comedy performance. Totally. It's so believable, because I literally was like, as a TV, like, this is voodoo. This is exactly <laughs> what this is. I didn't in one minute think, oh, I wonder how the actor is kind of pulling off this He's in the car you know wash. I mean? It's so good. And the guy's like, it's free today. I don't know, man. Like, I just work here. Uh, There's a lot of comedy DNA in this movie because yeah. you also have uh, Dick Sargent from, yeah, uh, from yeah. The Witch as the dad. Yeah. And uh, and then, you know, you go into the horror element with, with Zelda Rubenstein from Poltergeist, mm-hmm. obviously, oh. as, the, as the medium in Poltergeist and pretty much playing the same role here. And I just like, it reminded me of the craft in, in the way that there's just like this weird house or in the craft, there's this weird store that nobody ever went to yeah. until they did. And they're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. this has been in town the whole time. Yeah. Like nobody knew Zelda Rubenstein was just like hanging out yeah. in and be- town. <laughs> and and I love how they like, they make her like a little bit of a broke down witch. Like her, like also, everyone is so horny in this movie. Like the teacher, um, the first thing <laughs> Louise does, like the, her favorite teacher, she gets her a Latin lover and she's like, I don't even know what happened. And then like they go off and like bang. And then also Zelda Rubenstein making her Kermit the oh, Frog it's hotness. one of my favorite scenes <laughs> Sorry, of the set, whole. Sorry, let's set the scene up. It's, I, how could one even? So she's doing a spell on a frog, which I adore frogs. Mm-hmm. Just fun fact. Yeah, they're fun. Um, she turns him into a very hunky, very young blonde man. Yes. More power to her. And then she literally, like, I can only imagine reading your lines as an actor and being like, oh, that scene's today. <laughs> and she's literally like, tell me, like, talk to me, tell me dulcet tones or whatever. And the actor mouths the word ribbit, ribbit. while yeah. they ADR an actual frog, frog. ribbiting, <laughs> yeah. I believe is the verb. So it's pretty, it's pretty iconic. But she absolutely. Careful what you wish for. And she, she loved it. She absolutely banged that frog. Oh, for like, sure. Because like, she just like stayed and he quiet. loved it. Probably like, licked his back and got high. You know, like. <laughs> the psychedelic elements of, of licking a frog. Don't try it at home, kids. <laughs> But she literally, like, it's like, we don't need to talk. Yeah, and then she was like, you know, on second thought, shh. She absolutely banged that frog. But it's funny because, like, she's the agent of chaos, sort of like the shopkeeper in the craft is, where it's like, they know the power that, and and she can see the talent Mm. in witchcraft that uh, Blake Lively, that Blake Lively, that Blake Lively's 16-year-old, her sister, 
Robin Live, who I didn't know they were they were related. Yeah, I know. I didn't know that until recently. Either. Yeah, yeah. So she's looking at Robin Live, and she's like, "All right, this kid's clearly got game. Mm. I'm just gonna stir this pot." Same way oh, yeah. that the craft witch is like, "Okay, here's the here's all the stuff. Yeah. I just want to watch y'all do this. Like this yeah. is. I'm just so bored with my life as a <laughs> as as a spokestress that I want to watch everybody else in town just summon all this crap and just go nuts." Well, let's be real. She's old because she talks yeah. about the fact that Louise is is reincarnated basically. Like she was yeah. a, mm-hmm. another witch who was reincarnated. I also think that like this was also probably the very practical magic side of it. She probably died because she was in bed with the wrong man's husband. There's a very (laughs) clear you are a seductress vamp sort of like witch storyline in here that obviously got very um, sort of muted. There's incredible and iconic moments even outside of like we'll we'll get to top that but like we already talked about I like boys but the soundtrack. I really want to like make sure they made a teen witch musical and it was like an off-Broadway thing that like has been, like, produced and put around there. This is not, like, you know, Carrie the musical. This was actually a musical that people like. Yeah, yeah. And never going to be the same again. That song where she goes, <laughs> because um, I, the scene, it's literally my favorite scene, but she goes to her, like, icon, like, her version of Beyonce's concert, and the girl gives her her, like, touring jacket, which I'm like, when that spell was, wears off, how pissed is that woman oh, going to yeah. be? Like, <laughs> I gave like, it to a teenager. <laughs> Who just like magically got her name on the list? Like again, the powers that she's able to wield. I'm like, and you want to go there? Like, get me into like backstage at the Grammys. Like, girl, come on, <laughs> put me on every guest list I've ever been denied in my entire life. I want to go to the Chateau Marmont party with Jay Z and Beyonce. Anyway, whole point being, <laughs> she gets that piece of clothing, and then she goes and does like her like twisty thingy singing the song, and then she becomes the most popular girl in school, and that's the other most iconic moment. Um, I'm gonna be the most popular, like, bop, <laughs> bop. And this is, it feels like the movie that taught girls how to choreograph singing in the locker room, which is what <laughs> all of us guys know you're doing the whole time. Like, this is, this was an accurate portrayal of how women act during gym class. Did you like the music? It was, it was <laughs> just... <laughs> Stop there. Just so stop there. Ridic- it was. It because was. the movie doesn't tell you it's going to be that when it starts out. You know? Facts. Yeah, I don't think like the movie knew. Weird no, jazzercise yeah. opening that's clearly like a witch putting a spell on somebody. And <laughs> then you just have like normal brother sister stuff. And then we get to school and we kind of realize the, the haves and the haves nots. But then you just like cut to this. And you're like, oh, we're doing this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it did separate itself from Teen Wolf. It did say, hey, we're not the same movie because. Teen Wolf had some musical sequences. This is a musical Yeah. at this point. Yeah. I also love that the movie starts with a music sex scene. Like, yeah. she's in a wet dream. That's, again, like, just... Somebody needs to remake this and lean into that. But you, I wonder if, like, you the Gen Z kids... Would, you know what I mean? Like... I really think you could. I, I think that you need to find the right tone of, like, winking and nodding. But yeah. I think the Teen Witch has, like... I think as a property, does have potential. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's why the musical maybe did better than, like, the film a little bit before we got, like, its, like, second wave of yeah, all of, yeah, like, yeah. the millennial women being like, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but it's, like, it, it didn't know, which is partly why it works. It didn't know. It wasn't intentional or self-aware about the campiness. Mm. It was kind of like, are you musical? We're not really sure. Like, are you like a sex comedy? <laughs> kind of. Like, yeah. is, this like a t- is this like the craft? We just like want to be well liked. A little <laughs> bit. But look, the musical elements, the teenage vamp elements, and the everyone in this movie are so horny. All of the things that people <laughs> love the most about it. Like, absolutely. Like, besides the look of it, like, I feel like Let's look at where the the home runs were here as opposed to, like, the not home runs. And I think if they would have had, which they did, a a pretty high-level comedy and theater background, if they would have just leaned more into that because (laughs) the musical performances that were done by outside voices, great. (laughs) Mm. You know what I mean? Like, there's a reason why you don't see Louise singing. There's a reason why you can tell that there's a dub on yeah, some the very... woman that plays uh, her idol. Like, everybody is is singing along. And the few times where people actually like the rap scene, oh, Rhett. <laughs> Can we <laughs> talk about favorite. the three white He's guys in high school who are the rappers? I, I've Stop never... Oh, I, them, the dance in front of that car, just they on were a so sunny into it. afternoon. And they're not even, like, facing each other. It is... <laughs> what? Uh, I want to know everything. I want a whole mini series about these three white dudes. There's a great <laughs> video about this. So the actor that plays Rhett talked about how when they were getting ready to film it, he was like, 
I don't know, man. What? Like, <laughs> and the knew. gay, like, uh, music guy was like, yes, no, you're going to rap. And, like, he's, like, doing <laughs> the things to him. And he's just, like. And Red's, and he's, okay. like, he's, like, okay, you're a West Side Story choreographer. And, like, that guy had a dance background. So, yeah. like, a lot of the folks had dance backgrounds. They didn't have singing's background. But he literally thought, he's, like, this is going to be a career killer. And he does conventions now for it. So, set the scene on top of that because it is another <laughs> one of these great and iconic moments from this movie where Louise is first using her powers. And don't forget the floppy hat. <laughs> well, we can't because it is the star of the whole scene, yeah. you know, second only to Rhett. Yeah. So it's a beautiful sunny afternoon. Um, we have Polly and Louise biking around, just like talking about boys, uh, flappy hats. And she's like, I just, you know, like, I think that Rhett's like kind of cute. And she's like, whatever. And then magically, just three white men, as they do, dancing <laughs> sort of diagonal in the street, but not in the street. A yeah. little bit dangerous, yep. you know. B-boy and culture doing, at its <laughs> finest. <laughs> yeah. And they're doing like a fun, you know, one guy's looking over here, one guy's, and they're dancing and, and rapping with a boombox, I, I guess, to each other, uh, like a performance just amongst the All yells. white guys do that. Yeah. yeah. I'm Thank just you. I'm just a boy looking wondered. for two other white guys to start my rap group with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, so and, we've, and we love that for you. <laughs> and so they pull up and Polly's like, oh, man, I wish I was that cool. And so <laughs> Louise is like, Do you hold think? on. She says it with such longing. She's like, she man, does. I wish yeah. I was hip. And she was earnest with that. She was so genuine. Do you know what cool is, Polly? And, but for that, keep going. Oh, but it she, was. And Louise is like, hold on, girl, I got you. She's like, mm, and goes to her thought. And then all of a sudden the boombox is like, and then. Polly just yeah. lit up by the fire of God. Just who would ever really want to go and talk that with this like such a waste of pretty face of hanging in your know what space? I really wish she would. I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> oh my god! I literally, it's it's incredible. And she yeah. walks up and then they do this cool like this thing where he's here and then he, and then the thing and then she leaves and then she's like top that and gives one more of these and then leaves. And I've literally, I didn't know that I as a person could have chills yes. from secondhand <laughs> embarrassment. And that goes for the parodies as well. Yeah. Like other people who have made fun of this, yes. chill. I'm literally like, I want to die. This is the worst thing that will ever happen to me. It is <laughs> that bad. It is unreal. And the irony of this is weird in the sense that the directors and the writers were actually tapping into something because I've seen enough white boy rappers of our generation <laughs> mm -hmm. who were clearly of that time frame. Maybe they weren't teenagers being that dumb. Like the teenagers who were around <laughs> for that portion of rap realized this is not maybe us. But the little kids... The little kids did not know because those little kids grew up to be Jack Harlow. Like those little kids grew up to be. <laughs> I saw a lot did, of Marky Mark. You know what I mean? Inspiration. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's in those high school hallways. So I don't think it is as far off from like what a lot of suburban white kids were doing at that time. It just wasn't as cheesy to be watching it when you were living it. No, yeah. that's it, it, it almost like it. this movie, if it was bigger, it would have completely warped what the actual sense yes. of cool is for years and years <laughs> afterwards. Because there are a legion of dudes who are like, oh, like they think that that's cool, but they yeah. haven't seen it play out. Mm -hmm. And then they watch this movie. They're like, oh, look at how cool. OK, it is cool. <laughs> yeah. We just got like notarized, rubber stamped. Boom. I am cool for doing this. Yes. Uh, and it was um, the Italian guys that were attached to it. I was trying to remember um, Lam uh, Lambros de Monte. Uh, those two guys were the two ones that were like adamant about the top that scene because they're like, they're like, this needs to be a hipper movie. We can't have it feeling like it doesn't have enough edge to it. You know, we're going to take out the sex, but we're going to bring the edge in. What's edgy? <laughs> Rap music. <laughs> And so they added top that as a way to do that. And the main reason they also did it is the actress that played Polly, they felt she could pull off rapping more so than the other guys. And Boy, if you actually did she. and if you actually look at the performances, you see what they mean. I just I hope that I want to know what people think when they look at me and they're like, I don't know, I just feel like Grace could maybe do, you know, blank. <laughs> and it's like, we just think that Polly could rap, you know? Like, what a weird thought to have and then to actually do it, which I guess is a good thing that they did because it ends up being the most iconic scene of all time. It is probably a big reason why this has really withstood the test of time because it's so horrifying and <laughs> yeah. wonderful at the same time. But it, everybody goes for in this movie. Like, you're not going to get the Oscar-winning performances in Teen Witch, no. but, th but there's commitment. <laughs> it wasn't an award, darling. Unfortunately, it was not. Unfortunately, it, it was not. It did yeah. qualify, I guess, because it was released in theaters. But yes. <laughs> like, when we were talking about how it didn't do well at the box office, there's not doing well. Yeah. And then there, this budget was $2.5 million. It's opening weekend, it made $3,000. Yeah. Like, that's not even popcorn. Made, like, I, the math isn't mathing. Right. I spent more 
on a on a semester of college than this movie made at the oh. box office total. Like yeah. that, yeah. it's like less than thirty grand. Less and now you have grand. folks like producer Brian paying twenty bucks for a ticket. Yeah. to see it. You you just tripled <laughs> the box office. Well, this, this is they've talked about this very similarly to the room. Um, because of how much they licensed it, this movie made back its money eventually. Like it's like they put in two and a half million, but by the time it became. Because uh, I think they eventually did sell it to Disney. Like originally, it was just yeah, licensed like a, for a cable, while. But like, darling, I want to say eventually, after it became such a hit, <laughs> Disney's and, like, we, 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 we're tired of borrowing you. <laughs> yeah. We need this picture. <laughs> well, because they saw the, they saw banner. the viewership for it. They knew that kids. Because yeah. it was also the thing at that time. Disney was much more about their like half hour TV shows and stuff like that, and they had their movies. But it was um, movies that kids would stay watching if they came into it in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah. so they they wanted to have these movies that, like, no matter where people jumped into it, they would stay. And then they found that the musical numbers of it really kind of kept people going and top that and some of these other ones later on in the, in the story are the things that got it. Again, I can't talk enough about this, um, but I do have to talk about, again, another one, the finale. Oh. <laughs> um, very similarly to Pretty in Pink, and this is why I love calling this the coming of age. I don't know what costume designers were doing in the 80s, but whenever it gets to the end of the 80s and they have to put the the girl that we've been following in a banger outfit, the miss <laughs> of what that outfit is is so iconic. It becomes... Because, ex- like, could her shoulder pads been any higher? Scientifically, no. You know? Like, it's like the Pretty in Pink dress. It's like, girl, is this it? She did look like she was, like, suiting up. You like know? you're you're one football helmet show. Like I get that you're in love with a quarterback. <laughs> Do you, are you trying to play He'll on the team? This. Is that what you <laughs> like I want to do a ranking of like '80s finale boss level girl outfits, and this has got to be mm-hmm. like just F tier. Like yeah. along with the pretty and pink outfit, you know, there's so many of them. I think the one that's even the the sixteen candles outfit is awful. Mm-hmm. The there I'm like and like the glitter on the legs, which I they know. always do like the creepy slow pan, and you're like it well, was she's the 15. creepy slow We're still pan. Here. Yeah, still going. It's definitely the but creepy slow pan. But there's glitter. Pan. There's so much hairspray. Uh, the t- the tough chick in Nightmare on Elm Street three. Yeah, who like lives out her fantasy oh. to bite Freddy, and she's got like she's got like fingers that become <laughs> needles. And but she's wearing this like punk rock outfit. Oh my god! Like Joan Jett on steroids. This is yeah. Definitely, we need to do an iceberg episode on this where we just go deeper and deeper, <laughs> and, deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And I, I, I honestly feel like it's it's something that we can do. Ugh, I can't. But like the biggest <laughs> thing with, with, with this movie is is not the fault of the cast for me. Mm. And like that's why no, you know everybody works very hard in every movie. But like 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 what Tim said, the editing is so bad in this movie, and the direct it's just like the the shots they set up, like the scene where Brad is driving with his current girlfriend and they're like kind of making out. And so he doesn't see the road and he hits Louise when she's riding a bike. It's like, it's one of the worst sequences yeah. I've ever seen. I mean, it's a, in no way did he make any contact. No. And she just like, he like, like you think she's going to go like flying off the road into a ravine. No. She just casually pulls over to the side. And <laughs> Casual. Just, they didn't, didn't even just, need a Band-Aid. I mean, what, what are we doing here? I mean... I don't think they had the stunts budget for that. No, no. <laughs> they were like, if we yeah, take our not. lead actress out, we're down for like eight weeks. Also, let's give Fair. it up for a Robin Lively for, you know, starring in this movie because I just imagine the demands that she was having, they were having to make on her to stay believable, which she totally does throughout this movie. I don't feel a false note for her as Louise, but the insanity around her, like she's the straight man, technically, yeah. even though she's the witch. She does as good of a job grounding the action as anybody <laughs> could have. <laughs> And originally, they, they they went after Debbie Gibson to yeah, play that role, yes. and, and who's the huge teen pop star at the time. So you wonder how the movie would it, like would it be even more of like a madcap campy musical if Debbie Gibson had been in it? I mean, I think because that, I Debbie's think so, not sitting yeah. on the sideline when all those other cute girls are singing in the locker room. Yeah. Debbie ain't sitting on the sideline for that. I, I think <laughs> for what's interesting with this movie is you can tell that. For so many of the scenes, like the the reason why they had the extra actress, like the singer lady, is because those were originally going to be songs that were going to be given to the main character. Mm. That yeah, they then you eventually kind of feel that they were you know like. What I mean? eh. And if you watch the Teen Witch musical, which did become a thing, all those songs are hers. You know, never going to yeah. be the same again is her song. And uh, you know, I want to be the most popular girl is her song. It's not somebody else's song that she's listening to on the radio. Again, look, hey, I'll give them for their clever sort of way of turning into this. I'm literally just imagining the Teen Wolf, the Teen Witch remake <laughs> that I want to make. And I, <laughs> I, know, right? I, I just, I'm, I'm upset, you know, um, that we never got it. 
And I'm I'm sad now because it would have been the sex musical comedy for the ages. Has there been any Teen Witch like references in the Teen Wolf and in, in the MTV Teen Wolf, like in the show or the TV movie that they made based on it? Like, I wonder if Teen Witch, because it is such a, a weird cult classic that permeates like the culture. Like some deep cut. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't I mean, know. Riverdale. Riverdale okay. is what this show could have been and did do that. And it did have musical episodes and it did have sort of like a musical bent towards the end of it. But no, the Teen Wolf, the Teen Wolf show is actually if the Teen Wolf show was made by A24 and MTV. Like, that's what it was supposed to be like. It's meant to be like a real scary horror movie, but also with teenagers. So very um, Cabin in the Woods, very sort of like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like that. I wonder if we could, like, could you do Teen Witch today? Because, like, we, we, I think we know Sabrina so well as, like, the Teenage Witch. And, and I like that Netflix reboot that they did yes. a, a couple of years ago. So I don't know, like, would we have the appetite for another Teen Witch? Like, something in this lore? Or do you just think that it stands best as a time capsule of 1989 and how we just threw movies together? I think it's best as a time capsule because it could either go one of two ways. I either want like the gritty Fincher version, but then I'm like, oh, wait, we already have the craft. We're good. Or you got to really lean into the camp. And I think we're kind of like good on that front. I think it's like (laughs) (laughs) we're good. But it's also because it's so unintentional with Teen Witch. That's what makes it so great. And it's like I would be it would be a very I mean, there's definitely certainly very talented people who could pull it off, Mm. uh, meaning creators and producers. But I think it's like the fine line of it being so that they were just like, we don't know. It's We're just going to throw it on the wall. That's what makes it so great. So it's like if you were leaning into it, I think it would kind of take away what makes it so iconic because it's just so ridiculous. I think if Jennifer Bo- Jennifer's body could be a musical, I think that's where oh. I'm leaning to mm-hmm. where this kind of thing goes. Ooh, like, I don't hate what, that at all. I'm like, I'm like, and there's a uh, Polish horror movie called The Lore, which is actually out on Criterion Collection. And I have the copy of it, which is about mermaids, but the real story of mermaids, which were kind of built off on sirens and they kill people. And these are mermaids who leave the ocean because they want to join a rock band. And the way that they sort of uh, do that is by eating men. And... (laughs) And that a is cause part we can all of how get they, and it's very like, I mean, I'm like, I've, I've seen elements of this movie elsewhere. I think, I think, I think there's a movie in it. There's at least a romance novel in it. <laughs> hey, you five fishy broads, you really got something. I want to put you on my record label. <laughs> we do need the Italian producer being like, more hip hop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could totally see like the elements of West Side Story too, like yeah. in the choreography. Absolutely, yeah. I, I would. I would. It would be such a shame though if you if you tr- did try to do a Teen Witch and you just made it straight like scary, yeah, or like whatever. Because there is so much fun to be had in this world too. With like Winks and like you can Mean Girls yeah, this yeah. as well. That's and then yeah. they turned Mean Girls into a musical. So we already have the music for Teen Witch. Like we we already got the tracks. I I, I do I do feel that. Like I don't want to be like weird about it in in this one sense, but I'm like, no, I feel like this is definitely something that could happen. And so like let's make Yeah, it I think they were for a hot minute. I think Ashley Tisdale when she was like, you know, a Disney darling, they were gonna do a remake with her, but it kind of fizzled out. Yeah. Which I'm uh, actually kind of of Teen Witch or yeah. of, Oh really? I didn't which know I'm that. actually kind of happy about because I don't know that, that would have been I don't what I, I wanted, which is what's mm. important. No. Um <laughs> it's absolutely but what's there's important. definitely a world, yeah. Like if they did, I were watching. We're yeah. going. And maybe Blake Lively could be like a teenager. Yeah. Any other favorite moment? <laughs> just like just like Brad was twenty five years old. Shush. He, he was a hey, she could still play it. I saw her in that Chiefs uh, in that Chiefs box. Uh <laughs> She could do it. Any final moments that stand out to you, Mark, before we get out of here that you're like, I feel like I hit all of my faves and we talked about the actually, did we even talk about the final battle? We didn't. We got distracted by the by the awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's the dance. It's when they touch hands. Girl. That I just the scream that left my mouth. Just it's it's and, and pristine they, uh, for those who can't see it. But like when they do this thing, what they did in 80s dances where you like you go shoulder to shoulder and you go around each other in circles like this is like literally Darcy and and, and Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And like everybody knows the dance and they're all like twirling, <laughs> staring at each other's eyes. And that's not her. And I knew where this was going. And I'm a dummy when it comes to predicting movies. But I've seen Teen Wolf so many times, uh-huh. so many times that I'm like, oh, OK, she she no longer needs to use the spell. But she, Brad's in love with her, her. By the end of the movie, just like uh, Scott Howard didn't have to turn into the wolf. He was already a good basketball player. <laughs> now, albeit it would have been a lot easier victory if he had stayed the wolf. Yeah. You know, probably would have gone to pro if he stayed the wolf, but he didn't. So 
no D1 scholarship for you. But he ends up falling in love with the real her. And isn't that really what, what the film's about? It's is that, Yeah, I feel like there's some plot holes there because I'm like, well, but you did use the magic to get him. The magic there. really helped. Magic really helped. Sorry. Yeah. I, I've literally never apologized all for singing Team Witch to me. All of do them. they last? Does this couple last? No, no couple. No, certainly not. Because we not. got college coming up. Uh, statistically, 90% of uh, relationships that begin before the age of 30 end. So. Is that true? Before the age of 30? Oh, yeah. Re- 90%? 90% of relationships wow. that uh, begin before the age of 30 eventually end. Oh, they, are the, they are the early curve of divorces. <laughs> like, you know those people? Yeah, the, second, the, first yeah like, the first wave of divorces are <laughs> people that got out. married under the age of 30. You know what? I say good for you, kids. But yeah. what if they're not married? What if they're just coupling? Same. Okay. Oh. Okay. Like the idea of staying with somebody, uh, there's a great, I'm not, I can't believe I'm doing this because there's a great oh. Netflix special by Daniel Slosh called oh. Jigsaw, where he basically says that the he had just gotten out of a very toxic relationship. And if you are in any kind of a wobbly relationship, I do not advise you watch this because he says it's <laughs> responsible for over oh, yeah, 10,000 exactly breakups about. and, uh, oh, really? and hundreds of divorces because he basically puts the case to a lot of people. You don't know what it's like to be alone and you're so petrified of it. Mm-hmm. You don't yeah. want to admit how horrible the person sitting next to you right now in this show is. And, and oh, it's I, like I'm oh, living for but it. But he also says he's responsible for like a thousand engagements and a thousand other people realizing, oh, no, no this is my person. Um, I, I And the one thing I will remember from that was when he said is like, do not get married young. You do not know yourself. Your brain's not finished developing until 27. If you're neuro, uh, on the neuro spectrum, it's like 32. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, that's <laughs> hence why I will never legally so, marry anybody. Wait until you're an older <laughs> lady an and you start casting spells on toads and frogs and <laughs> yeah. it, when you really know what you want out of life. I, I mean, but seriously. those were some of my favorite scenes in the movie. I didn't realize that the term lookbook went all the way back to the 1600s. Yes. <laughs> they had a lookbook. <laughs> she like actually a has... book from, from 1600s. I'm not saying that there was a lookbook, but the idea of, like, who's who. Like, there used to be marriage prospect books where they would put women in their, like, cattle that you could buy at the marriage Did market. they call it a lookbook? I don't know if they called it a lookbook, but Just it was the cattle book. I mean, they might have called it a lookbook. I don't know. I remember my Similar parents were talking cattle. about having a lookbook in college. I'm like, how old is that? So yeah. maybe it does go back. <laughs> to the Salem witch trial day. Maybe it does. I think at a time when, before the internet, the people were always looking for a way to find out who's who's who, where, and where we can get it. That's fair. Yeah. I've been spoiled by Al like Gore's OG technology. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about you, ma'am? I what, think, do you think, what are you thinking? I think the only last scene that I would love to touch on is the iconic scene when she turns her brother into a dog yes. and goes into <laughs> the next room to a full, ready-to-go, beautiful bubble bath. No explanation. Yeah, <laughs> it's just uh, there. Throws him in, which reverses his spell. Again, no explanation. We don't know why water. Dogs uh, don't like baths. Oh, that's, there yeah, that's yeah. it. And I love that the whole time he's clearly like hiding in the bath and she's also like breaking the whole scene. Yeah. Like she's totally laughing the whole time. And it's just like, and that's it. We never know why. It doesn't, never it adds why. nothing um, other than joy to No, my the soul. wish fulfillment of teenage <laughs> girls to have their brother not be annoying. This was very in that <laughs> And Clarissa, into a very yeah. cute yeah, dog. Yeah, yeah, the Clarissa explains it all time frame of like, oh. I hate my younger brother, sort of like teenage girldom. Like that was very that. I mean, I don't have any brothers, but I would love more dogs. So I, <laughs> I, I get it. You wouldn't yeah. reverse yeah. the spell. I, yeah. I, I never got into that trope of like trying to find my sister's diary. I had an older sister, like perfect age difference. She's two years older than me. We're like, I should be fit. I never cared about her diary at all. Is it, yeah. No, I, ew. It is weird. I think like uh, also too, like I think if we like put the clock later on in life, uh, Richie's not dating men. <laughs> now dating men. You no, know what not, I mean? No. You know what I mean? Like, Happily married, I believe. You know what I mean? Like, he, well, no, he is dating men. That's my whole point. That's is what like, I'm if, you, if yeah. you're interested in your older sister, it's probably because you want to be her in that way. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah, like, right. interested. Yeah, yeah. Like, like I want to read your diary. Girl. I want to read yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you're, you're a messy queen in training. <laughs> I guess <laughs> that's, that's what why. that is. And I say that with love, but like, <laughs> yeah. This is, I ironed your homework. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, that's it's very that. <laughs> Morning paper. Yeah. Like, who needs iron ho- homework, too? Like, is that a thing? It's, and he's great. I, this kid has, like, two scenes with maybe seven lines. And all. Oh, Fanta- the best performance in the whole film. Mm-hmm. Stole the movie. Um, and this movie stole our hearts. Um, it let's, did. Let's go ahead and say thank you so much, Heather <laughs> Grace, ma'am. This is... Do you go by Heather or Grace or both? Uh, by Grace. I just like to confuse people and make it as, as hard as okay. possible for everybody. I was going to say, like, I don't want to not call you by your full government name that you put on the top <laughs> of this. But then I'm like, but I feel weird calling you Grace when this thing says Heather Grace. It's right there. No, yeah, no. Everybody. Go- 
I the still only- see it to this day, and I've known Grace a long time. I still see it, and I'm like, who the hell is that? I thought we had <laughs> and Grace. Like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I know it's like because it's like performance wise, like acting wise, I go by that's like my SAG name, so mm-hmm. it's always like a weird like, well, here that's me, but like. Go by Grace. It's me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you gave us Grace in this episode because this movie by a lot of people <laughs> would, be, would be awful. But thanks to you, we enjoyed the heck out of Thank it. Thank you so um, much for having me. Really quickly before we do a little bit of housekeeping, keeping, let folks know where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me online everywhere at Get Your Gracing. Get Your Gracing. I yeah. Love that so much. Thank you. Um, Mark, the, we've come to a moment that I've kind of dreaded talking about, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm bittersweetly happy because I'm glad that we got to do Teen Witch. This is a movie that I've been trying to get us to for a long time. It's and been on the list. It has been on the list. And when we started this podcast, what was it? Four years ago. Four wow. years ago. In the dead of the pandemic. Nothing to do. With nothing to do. I was just like, if we can get this thing going on for 100 episodes, I'll feel good. If we and get this thing back to being in a studio. Yeah. That'd be amazing. That would be amazing, That's too. Crazy. Yeah, because we had started this and wanted to film it in the studio, and then we had to do it digitally, and that was not good for my brain. But... After four years, and how many episodes, Brian, total? I think we're like one. One sixty. I was going to go one thirty. It's too low. Damn. Yeah, over, over, almost. Yeah, four years. Um, almost to the day. We are calling it quits on Rotten Tomatoes is wrong. It is. Um, it's been a. It's been a fun ride though. It's been an amazing journey, and uh, it's you know you look at the book, the the rotten movies we love, and you look at all the movies that we've defended. Some movies have actually rebounded very nicely. Yeah, like a Sister Act two. Yeah, where you go from where it was when we did the episode to where it is now, and it's like there there was an impact. You put fresh eyes on a movie that was maligned for whatever reason by critics, and it's kind of fun to talk about that. And I feel like no offense to you, ladies. Once we get into the Teen Witch. Maybe it is time to just put the brakes on <laughs> yeah. and say, I, we might have covered all the movies that people care about us covering. I mean, really. And that's like, that's the main reason why we're doing it. We, When we set out to do this, we wanted to bring attention to movies that we felt were sort of fairly maligned. We wanted to make sure that at the Rotten Tomatoes, we get a lot of heat for maybe like throwing tomatoes at movies when really we celebrate the bad ones as much as we celebrate the quote unquote good ones as far as the score. And this has been a great expression of that. But it is time to pause so that we can do other things so we can have other podcasts where I get to talk to Mark and folks like Grace on movies. And so this is our penultimate episode of Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. And we will have an episode next week and a wrap up. And so we really encourage any of you guys that are still listening and that have liked the show and loved the show over the past few years to let us know what you think about the show, because we're going to have a send off episode um, that will be our very last episode after. But our last movie cover episode will be next week. And then we'll do our wrap up after that. And I just want to thank all of you guys for listening. It has been a great and incredible and hilariously fun ride. I can't wait to recap some of my favorite moments over this amount of time. Uh, Mark, anything to add? And amazing guests. Yeah, like, all the guests. Like Grace, yeah. Heather, Grace Hancock. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's been awesome to have uh, just great companions, great producers behind the scenes with yeah. Lucy and Brian and just like so many people kind of working to make sure that we're on time. Like we, we get our, our show out on time and we're in the booth and we're sounding good and all that good stuff. Um, so email us, RT is wrong at RottenTomatoes.com and let us know what was your favorite episode? What movies did we not get around to get to? Yeah. I can't believe you didn't defend this because there will be one last opportunity yeah. on our final, final episode to do it. But this was our penultimate movie, like Jacqueline said. Yeah. We have another one that I think could rival Teen Witch as our <laughs> send off for uh, the next time you guys hear and see us. Look, we got Mark to do Encino Man. We got the goofy movie in here. This is one oh. that I've been also saying for a long time, and that is The Last Dragon. Uh Barry Gordy's magnum opus to <laughs> kung fu black exploitation. I cannot wait to talk about this movie. It is, uh, it, it look. If you watched that episode of Insecure and didn't know about this movie, now you know. I recommend if anybody hasn't seen Teen Witch or The Last Dragon, do what I did and double feature it yeah. because your brain is going to be all sorts of crazy mush <laughs> afterwards in the most delightful in way the most possible. delightful way possible. Um, Heather Grace. Thank you so much. I'm just going to say Grace. Grace. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm just going to make everybody call me Grace Heather Grace. Like like Burger Meister Meister Burger. That's what I'm going to do now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you for being here. Thank you for being one of our amazing guests and being a part of our send-offs is really great. And we will see you all next time on our final episodic uh, covering a film episode of Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. Again, thank you all for listening. We'll see you all next time. 